Alex Pereskavis. Here. And Kate Schwarzler. Here. All right, everybody have a chance to uh, read over the minutes from the December 7th, 2020 meeting. Any changes to make note of? Uh, there was in the vote uh, on the legislative amendment, uh, I think uh, Becky is in both the A's and the nays. Oh, the <laughs> okay, I think she was a nay. It was that yes, correct? That's, that, correct. that's why. Yeah. yeah, so I just didn't move her. Yeah, no problem. Becky, thank you. Yep. Thanks, Alex. Uh, any other changes to note? Okay. Anyone wish to do a motion? I'll move to accept the minutes as amended. I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. Motion granted. Uh, minutes are approved. All right. We'll move on to visitor and public comments. Anybody out there, Karen? Okay. Um, I don't think we have any unfinished, an unfinished business to deal with, so we'll move on to the new business uh, with the review of the sign code, proposed amendments. Take it away, Fred. All right, perfect. So, um, so hey, everybody. Uh, nice to see everybody. Nice to be here at the meeting uh, today. Just want to, so essentially, here's the deal. So we got a request from the fire department, the fire district, and they said, hey, we want to put up a changing image sign. Can we do that? We said, well, let's look at the code. And we looked at the code. And essentially what happens is they are in a residential zone. Um, it's actually high density residential on, on Monmouth. And, um, and because of that, they are limited to 24 square feet of signage and they cannot have a changing image sign. They said, well, shoot. We would like to potentially rezone our property or something then. And um, my response was ultimately, if, if we want to do that, it's probably easier to change the sign code to allow you guys to have a changing image sign than to, to tr try and change your zoning. If we're changing your zoning, we're going to have to go through some sort of uh, uh, buildable lands and or a housing needs analysis sort of thing and show that we're not impacting the quantity of uh, housing in any sort of way. And it just felt like it was probably easier to make a small change um, to the sign code to allow them to have that. Now, having said that, um, you guys don't have to uh, allow the change to the sign code. You don't have to allow a changing image sign on a residential property. We just thought, um, you know, it kind of makes sense. Right next to them, if they were to be in the commercial zoning, which is directly to the east of them, they'd be allowed something like it's in it's in the staff report, like 169 square feet of signage, um, and they would be allowed the changing image sign within that 169 square feet. What we are proposing is just a simple uh, change that says uh, you can see it on page nine of your packet there. Um, the following signs and no other are permitted in a re any residential zone. It, it would be one permanent sign for public service uses on lots that are larger than five acres in size and are located along Highway 51 outside of the downtown overlay zone. The sign shall not exceed 48 square feet in size, of which 24 square feet may be an electronic changing image sign. Now, why 24 square feet for the changing image sign? Because that's our maximum amount that we allow for a changing image sign. Uh, why 24 square feet? Because that's what's allowed in a residential zone currently. And I went out there and I sort of paced off their existing sign. It's about 24 square feet. Um, so, um, so that's sort of where I came up with the 48 square feet. Potentially, it could be um, bigger. Potentially, uh, I. Uh, so yeah, that's essentially this code change. Again, they are in a place that kind of makes sense for changing image signs. You've got the one at the high school. You've got the one at um, First Baptist right right along there. Um, it probably makes sense for a changing image sign in that location, um, but they're just not allowed because they're a residential zone. It's sort of a quirk of the code. So 
that's basically what this um, code change is presenting. Does anybody have any thoughts, any suggestions, any uh, concerns? I just had one question. How did they get to build a fire hall or fire station in a residential area? Was that an exception or is that allowed? That's allowed. Um, all of our um, all of our zones, be it commercial or residential, allow um, public public service uses in in them. Um, you know, potentially at that point they could have gone through its own change to to do that, but they didn't. Okay. Thank you. Fred, I have a quick question. So is public service uses defined somewhere in the code? You know, I, I'm pretty certain. Um, I can double check that real quick. Um, if it's if it isn't, I would maybe consider adding language such as like public ownership or land ownership for public health and safety or something along those lines so that we don't leave it open to interpretation that anybody could come along and say well this sign is a public service yeah okay i think that's a um yeah that's exactly the question i was going to ask and the other thing i was going to ask is um and i don't tell me why i'm wrong or tell me why this is a bad idea but is it is some sort of like overlay for public things like that, like different, like public zoning or something like that, that, I mean, would that still require a full process if you added something like that? Uh, you know, it's funny because, I mean, I, I actually do think that's not a bad idea. Right now we do have the public service zone, which is sort of like a zone by itself. I mean, yeah, it might not be a bad idea ju just to sort of throw a, to consider it more as an overlay and have like an underlying zoning. So, but right now that's not, it's, it's not really structured like that. The code's not really structured like that, but I don't think that's a bad idea at all. Um, so let me look. Uh, we do have a public services zone, which is Part of the reason why I use that language, um, but let me just see. Nope, we don't have public services specifically defined. It is um, what I'll do is I'll tweak it. Uh, I mean, we we have in our residential zone and our um, commercial zone language related to public and quasi-public uses. Um, so, and it talks about how their uh, buildings and structures operated by a government. I'll, I'll show you. Hold on. I'll just share the screen. I'm looking at it. Uh, hold on. Share screen two. Well, Fred, it could be as simple as just saying, you know, one permanent sign for public service uses as defined in section. Right. Whatever. Right. So you'll see this is sort of how our public quasi public use looks and then it talks about uh, structure necessary for the city or a public utility to provide uh, service to the neighborhood in which it's located and then buildings and structures occupied by are operated by a governmental agency or public utility and necessary for public service. So, um, so yeah, no, I think that that's um, that's that's good. Uh, I'll, I will, uh, I'll tweak that a little bit and then I'll bring that back to, uh, the next, the next meeting for you folks, just to look at that language to make sure that makes sense. Is a school considered a public use? It is. Yeah. And they are in the public services zone. Some of the things that we have in public services zone include, um, Oh, shoot. I wish I had a zoning map open. Let me pull up, open a, so we got like the high school, the middle school, the elementary school, like our downtown parks are in a public services zone. Um, uh, I think that's pretty much it. Oh, the, the gate building and, um, and the First Baptist Church are both in the public services zone as well. Um, so. 
So Fred, the public service zone is an overlay of the high density residential. Is that how no, we describe it? No, it's 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 not actually uh, it's not an overlay. Let me um, it's that's not how it's structured right now. It's actually its own standalone zone. Let me I'm pulling open the uh, map so we can all look at it together. And I'm sharing the right screen this time. So here we go. So here's our zoning map. And so you can see this PS is all public services zone. So you can see this right here is the high school. This is a First Baptist Church right there. This is Monmouth Street um, coming through there. That's Pioneer Park right there. These are our sewer treatment ponds right here. This is a bit of Ash Creek right there that the city owns. Um, that right there is the school bus barn. Um, th these are the parks along the waterfront. This is probably Henry Hill Inspiration Garden. Uh, this is Monmouth's well site down here. So that's so the the zone itself is its own standalone zone. Right now, it's not a, an overlay. There's no underlying zone underneath this. It's just a public service zone right now. So, but rather than just taking this piece right here, because uh, this is a fire district piece right here where my hand, where my little, can everybody see my little hand thing? Um, this, uh, this is the fire district piece right here. And rather than taking this out and making it blue or even making it red, um, it would just, uh, sort of create a small little exception in the sign code that says for certain parcels that are a certain size along this road, uh, some additional uh, uh, sign allowance would be allowed. That's essentially the idea. Because it's probably the simplest way because anybody who would look at uh, rezoning is going to look at that size of piece of property. And they're going to be like, that's going to have impact on housing in the community. Right when in reality, Monmouth's wastewater treatment ponds are right here, and this is a lot of wetland back here. So the idea that um, we're going to get a whole ton of housing back there is it's not likely, but we would probably have to prepare some sort of document to show that rezoning it is not going to have an impact to housing. So rather than do that, we just suggested, hey, let's make a small change to the sign code. Does that make sense? It does. Thank you for explaining. Yeah, no problem. OK, any other questions for Fred? I'll admit that it doesn't seem like the most elegant solution, but I absolutely understand kind of what you're what you're thinking. I, I think, I mean, in a perfect world, like an, I think the overlay kind of something seems like the most useful, but I also don't like, it just seems like a lot of work for one parcel. Yeah. And, you know, I feel like i I actually feel like, um, the, the situation we are, we'll be able to address this situation when we actually go through a more thorough review of the sign code, which is, um, which we know we have to do because we know that there's, there was a court decision recently about uh, speech on signage. Um, you know that you can't you can't uh, regulate speech on signage, and we want to go through our code to make sure that um, we're not we're not running afoul of that. So we'll have to do that at a certain point. And when we do that, and when we incorporate the stuff that we we're talking about for the historic preservation, that you know the downtown science standards that we were talking about a while ago, we'll probably want to do a more holistic sign code update. And as part of that, I imagine that we'll look more holistically at like the amount of signage that we allow along certain roads, you know, because you don't want to allow really big signs on residential streets, but on Monmouth Street, it, it kind of makes sense to have bigger signs, right? So I think we'll get to it 
then. Okay, so you'll bring back the updated language to the next meeting and then we'll have a vote on it to do this or? Um, I'll bring the updated language back to the next meeting, but then it will probably be the following one that we have the, the hearing itself on it just because of the way that notice and all that stuff times out. Um, we also have Troy Crafton from the fire district on the line. Let's just see if he has anything that he wants to contribute to this discussion. Hello. Hello, oh, Troy. Can you guys hear me and see me? My yeah. internet's not that great here at the house, so we'll see. Um, we are getting quotes right now. Um, we wanted to be able to finish the sign, uh, sorry, by um, July or June 30th, basically, um, because it's budgeted for this uh, this fiscal year. So um, as long as we can make that work and you guys, we could work together and, and uh, that would be great. Um, but to be able to meet that deadline, it's gonna take them two months or three months in, in, uh, to actually install the sign um, with the design and getting back and forth. So we just got the quotes back. We're gonna uh, have a meeting uh, with the board meeting next Thursday to decide which, uh, which sign we're gonna go with. And um, that's, that's, all, that's where we're at right now, so. Okay, thanks, Troy. Well, it sounds like uh, the time frame was, will work for the fire district. Okay. So, yeah, I don't think we have any objections to proceeding with that, Fred. Yeah, no, well, uh, I mean, if you guys are fine with it, I realize it's, I definitely take your point, uh, Alex, that it's not the, the nicest solution. It'd be nice to think uh, uh, more well round or, you know, more holistically, but I don't know. So yeah, sounds good. Uh, I'll keep on working on it and start stuff moving forward. And yeah, uh, you guys will see it again in the future. Okay. Right. Well, thank you, Troy. Thank you. Thank you very much for your guys' time. Good night. Okay. Uh, we'll go ahead and move on to uh, the second agenda item, review of site di design review code, proposed amendments. Excuse Take me away. one moment real quick, um, Mr. Um, Chair. I just wanted to point out that uh, I got a direct message from Commissioner Adams and she had to log off real quickly. And uh, so she is not at now, now at the meeting, but she is excused. Okay. Thanks, Karen. Okay, Fred, um, how about a staff report for the second agenda item? Perfect. So this is another super simple thing, um, but it's something that is, is kind of important. Uh, or it's, I mean, it's a good thing to do. So this right here, we have some language in our site development review standards that have been used in the past to take a, a site and then add 25% to it, and then add another 25% to it, and then another 25% to it, and then another 25% to it without having to go through the site design review of the site development review process again. So essentially, if if you got time and a building on your property, eventually you could build out the entire site without having to go through site design review again, or site development review. I'm gonna call it site design review over and over again, because that's always what I've called this. Um, and here, here it's called site development review. I'm just never gonna get used to it. <laughs> so anyways, um, site, so, Essentially, what this small change would do is essentially say, you can only do that 25% uh, expansion of your footprint one time, and it would establish a cap at the maximum amount that you could do without going through site development review again. That cap would be 8,000 square feet. Um, the, the intent of this is basically to stop folks from thinking that they can continue just doing 25%, 25%, 25%. So um, that's essentially what this code um, does. To be honest with you, I thought it, 
I, when I read it originally, I thought, yeah, you can only do 25% one time. But then I was told, oh, no, people in the past here have allowed people to go 25%, 25% over and over and over. So um, this would change that. Are there any thoughts? Are there any questions about that? Now, what, oh, I should step back just a little bit. What is site development review? Site development review is a review process where the public can actually comment on, on an application, right? Um, it's sent to people within 250 feet of the property. It's also an, a, a decision. Without site development review, there's no sort of land use component of a project, right? There's no notice that goes out for the project. And so, um, especially in situations where this could involve somebody like eventually building out their site with no public review, um, with no sort of review of stormwater and stuff like that, that just does not feel quite uh, right to me. So this would establish like, um, Essentially, essentially parameters for how that 25% could work. Um, hopefully I explained that well. Are there any questions? It just makes sense to me because you wanna be able to control aspects of the development. And if they just keep going and going and going, you know, without, now with the input of property neighbors, uh, I think it could lead to a lot more hassles and people being upset. So mm -hmm. I think so, it's a good idea. Site development review is also where things like traffic impact studies right. could potentially come in. Um, so, yeah. Any other comments or questions? So this one, you'll have to come back to us again for a public hearing. Yep, that's right. Okay. Well, I'd say go for it. I'm back I just, I had to read the language you're inserting several times to understand exactly what you were trying to say. I don't know if it was just me blanking on it, but it was kind of a convoluted um, addition there. Any provided that any expansion of the building which would add more than 8,000 square feet to a structure shall require site development review. It just was an awkward to me, awkward way of saying that. Right. Um, so, I mean, if you have a better way of saying it, that's that's fine. Um, and I, I'll definitely take I'll definitely take that. Basically, the intent is to say that. Um, if I don't, my math is probably not right, but if the, if the building is what, 32,000 square feet and you want to add 8,000 square feet to the building, um, that would then require site development right. review too, even though, um, even though it would meet that 25% standard. So anything where, you know, anything where it was like a 40,000 square foot building trying to add 25%, then it would require site development review. But if they added more, it, it says more than 8,000 feet. So they could add up to 8,000 feet, right? 8,000, yeah, up to 8,000 square feet. Right, essentially the, essentially the idea is, sure, you can add 25% to your building one time, but it can't be more than 8,000 square feet. Yeah. I understood that, it just, took a while working through yeah and I couldn't figure out how to say it differently so I'm sorry I don't have any suggestions it just well if you if you if you're if you think anything just <laughs> let me know I think okay. that's, that's Thank great. You. is there any interpretation the way it says any one-time commercial that someone could say well our 25 percent was a one-time thing and then years later they're like we're going to make one more one like on a different side like is there any sort of like ambiguity there or is that just me trying i don't know i i wouldn't know how to say it any different you know and again i also i can think on it but i, I don't have a particular solution but yeah yep 
yeah, you know, yeah. If anybody has better a better way to write it, that sounds good. You know, a lot of times with code code changes, like if it's not a major overhaul, I try and go into the text and keep it as similar as I can to not not confuse people about what's actually going on with the change. But if there's a much simpler way to say that, I would be all ears. That would be that would be excellent. Well, it, it would be too that if uh, commercial property came to the city, the, it could be explained verbally, yeah. and they might understand that differently than reading it. Yeah. Well, and I mean, frankly, that's how a lot of the the code explanation happens as we explain what's going on to people more so than having people read it. Though I will say our code changes have made it a whole lot easier for folks to actually understand what's going on in the code. Like I've gotten a whole lot more people saying, hey, I was looking at your code and I'm curious, can I do this? And, you know, so that's good. Okay, any other questions of Fred or comments? Okay, well, we'll look forward to having a public hearing on that next month then, Fred? No, two months, two, two months. months again. Yep. Okay. All right. Cool. Um, well, hey, let me, since we got, since we didn't take all that long to do all that stuff, let me just show you one. So, you know, I won't talk to you too much about the transportation system plan this time. <laughs> um, but like, let's, let's actually talk about an, an idea. Um, because, you know, as I mean, I'm, and I'm not saying that you, you remember, didn't last time we talk about like the square about concepts and the rectangular abouts and all, all of those sort of things. Well, one idea that Karen mentioned at the end of the last meeting was she says, you know, well, the rectangle about is oriented around the wrong street, right? Ultimately, C Street should be the center of the thing, not Monmouth, right? You remember, uh, or not, yeah, not Monmouth. You remember that last time? All right. Um, let me see if I actually got it. Oh, yeah, okay. Well, I'll try and share this real quick. So we had our little, I can't, uh, I, I had a couple of days off, right? So I can't quite remember exactly when was what, but, um, oh, pff, and then I, shoot. That was a total fail. Did you see that? I kind of fumbled the X. Now I got to pull it up open. I'm sorry. I X'd it out. Are you talking about where we were talking about like one way to like one way rectangular kind of traffic pattern? Yeah, right. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, we weren't calling them rectangular abouts or anything, but yeah, I get what you're saying now. Yeah. So, um, so you remember, uh, let me try and share this again. I pulled open the other one too. So. Oh, and then I shared the wrong screen. Um, okay. Uh, you guys can see that, right? I'm over here, right? Can everybody see the map? All right, perfect. Um, you'll remember last time we sort of were talking about this and we said, oh, Monmouth could be sort of, we could have one way traffic. It could function kind of like a roundabout. You guys remember that from last time? Did we talk about that? Well, it's funny. We had that little open house and one of the comments at the open house said, I really like that idea. You know, that actually makes some sense because they heard the idea of sort of a plaza street at, on Monmouth. And they're like, that kind of makes some sense. Um, well, Karen then said, you know what? Um, that is oriented wrong. And really it should be um, using B Street and Monmouth and have C Street be the Plaza Street. And so I'm just throwing this out there because I actually kind of think it's a, a interesting idea because then we can start pulling the park up into downtown, right? Which would be super cool, right? Uh, potentially. Um, so we could we could make some something like C Street where you could have parking at certain times a day. We could close it off at certain times, and then it could start being it could start functioning more as a festival sort of street. And yeah, pulling the activity 
into different parts of downtown, right? Instead of just having it along the river. So I wanted to show you guys that idea. Do you folks have any thoughts about that idea? Do you have any uh, aversions to it? I, it's just something that we didn't talk about last time. I didn't want to blindside you with with this idea in the future. I, what are your sort of thoughts? It makes more sense than making Monmouth. I mean, if you're talking about pulling people into the shops and stuff downtown and trying to connect with the park, C Street makes a lot more sense. Yeah. I have some just questions or comments maybe for some further investigation. Um, there's a lot of studies out there that show that going to a one-way sort of couplet can be super detrimental to the streets in terms of business. Um, Eugene actually took one of their streets out. They reverted it, basically. They had it closed down for quite a while, the downtown mall, and then they um, downtown slowly started to die. So they actually opened it back up. Um, there's some other case studies for that as well. So that would be my concern is just with the main street going one direction. It seems like it wouldn't make that big of a deal, but for those businesses on those two blocks, it could actually potentially have some big implications for them. Um, with that said, I love the idea of having C Street be a festival street and we've played around with that, even, you know, closing that down for special events, say like Hoppin Heritage or a concert, um, a lot of pushback from those businesses uh, in terms of doing that, the ones located there on C Street. So I think we would just need to consider that. Um, and some of that is a lot, a lot of it centers around parking and noise and um, that sort of thing, access to their businesses and potential vandalism or, you know, things that might happen. Yeah. I think my other, my only other concern is uh, I'm imagining commercial trucks. I'm imagining combines trying to weasel their way through, uh, like that right turn from Monmouth, at like right at the, right at the corner of Monmouth and 51, like right at you know the three way stop. I'm imagining a combine trying to make that right, or even like a 53 foot trailer trying to make. You know, it's already bad enough watching those guys try to make that right from. 51 to Monmouth Ave, but just try, I, it's, it seems like something would have to give uh, mm -hmm. to make that work. Yeah. So I do like the idea of the plaza kind of concept um, a lot. I just, I don't know if I can fully wrap my brain around sort of people that are not, that are just using downtown as a pass through rather than a destination, it, it sort of, it, it makes, and again, we, I know we talked last time about uh, the consultants seemed like they were trying to make it easy for traffic rather than sort of look like a livable community space, I think is what kind of my sense was. And I'm not, I'm not trying to sort of make it easy just for like, oh, it's easy, you know, hard to get trucks through downtown because that's not necessarily the point, but functionally mm -hmm. that's the only real arterial route. And so- Right, right. I do right. Wonder, no, I I'm, keep on going, Becky. I do wonder about having to take all of that traffic that wants to go west on Monmouth, two blocks north, mm -hmm. then a block west, then back south. I'm wondering if people won't cut through one block south of Monmouth Street and come up to second and then go that way on their own rather than going more out of their way. Right. Yeah, no, that makes sense. I would. Yeah, no doubt. No, that makes good sense. Another thing, Fred, um, has the railroad had any, in, any words of wisdom about this too? I know in the past, um, wasn't there an issue? I think there was an issue between the city and the railroad about maintenance of the road. And finally, the railroad, I don't know if it was a railroad or the city of independence, did improve that. I mean, that street used to be horrible mm. at, when you came down. and. If it's like this, it's going to have to be more maintained probably than it is even now with the volume of traffic. But it right. was, was a railroad consulted about impacts and and then time of day when the, I mean, the train, mm -hmm. 
does it come through once a day, twice a day? I mean, I usually hear it like at seven in the morning and maybe not every day, but uh, I would think the railroad would have some kind of uh, words of wisdom on that too. I mean, I, and I do, like everybody said, I like the idea of the C Street Plaza. Um, I know that would be an impact to some of the, the businesses, if not all the businesses, but if it would be, there would be some parking during certain times of the day. I mean, I, I go to C Street Salon when I could, put my hair cut, and I don't know how many times I'd have to park, you know, way on the next block up. Because there's just no parking spots down there at 9 and 10 in the morning. But I don't know. I guess my only my only concern would be with the railroad, what they would say about it. But. Right. Yeah, no. Uh, so, I mean, we definitely did reach out to the railroad and ask them to participate in this uh, project. And they politely declined uh, or politely declined. Uh, so yeah, no, uh, I think, man, I think all of your points are really good. And uh, it's just a hard sort of, it's, it's a hard intersection, right? It's just some hard choices that, that we got to try and make here. So anyways, I appreciate you guys, uh, your thoughts about, about that. I definitely, I definitely do respect your guys's vision that we are not trying to build a community for cars, right? I'm I'm fair I'm fair to say that, right? That's that's your your folks' perspective, right? That's that's definitely my vote. Yeah, so I love that, um, you know, and and I just. I, yeah, I really, I really love that. And I, you know, I took last week off and I, I was really thinking about like, just like, how, how do you design a city for, for a human, right? How, for a, for a human and almost like the, the, the lowest um, ability human, how do you design it for like a kid or how do you design it for a guy in a scooter or, you know, like who, who just cannot get around in the same way that that you or I can, you know, how can how can we design a, a place that's friendly for that? And so I don't know, that's sort of the nut that I'm trying to trying to figure out here is like, you know, we're we're trying to design in bikeability and walkability and all that sort of stuff. But you know, bikeability is kind of subjective, right? Like who what sort of bikeability are we gonna design to? Are we gonna design it to um, like were we talking about this, the Speedo guy or the, no, the spandex guy, right? Are we going to design it to, to his ability or are we going to design it to like the five-year-old trying to like learn how to ride a bike the first time, you know? Um, I don't know. Ultimately, I think we should like have, wouldn't it be sweet if we could have uh, a five-year-old navigate this community on a bike? Like, wouldn't that be awesome? Like, I, I don't know. That's sort of where I'm, that's sort of where I'm at trying to figure that out. I've been watching some really inspiring stuff out of, out of the Netherlands, you know, and they just designed their whole country, man, for people to get around by bikes, you know, it's like, wow, that is, that is inspiring. Right. I think the flip side of that is, uh, not building for cars, but understanding that like, you have to have a car and then, and, and, and so making it and making it so downtown continues to be accessible to everybody. So, I mean, I'm imagining like, you're still going to need parking, like you're still going to need all sorts it's of things. Still going to need to get people through that intersection, but how yeah. do you do it in a way that sort of values everybody and doesn't. Yeah. I just want to, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Just, yeah. yeah no, to, no, it, you're... An impossible balance to strike almost. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, it really is because, I mean, we can't kid ourselves like um, the vast majority of our trips right now are by car, you know, but how do we, how do we, how do we change that? I mean, I think to me, what it speaks to is kind of what we had talked about a few months ago about you should be a quarter mile away from park or, you know, commercial kind of place like so building those little pockets so that you're not forced to drive if you need to go somewhere i know the city of salem i was on a as an a, listen to a presentation from them about 
to kind of their rezoning and in, in neighborhoods and in little pockets and like that kind of stuff to, it, you know for me personally it really speaks to me so i i think it's it's the balancing all of that right well and i love the idea of being able to say like on the fourth of july have have it be very accessible to people on foot and bike who want to be able to you know, leave their car at home or park, be able to park kind of out of the way and walk safely or bike safely to the activities. And even like the festival street, I love that idea of making C street. And I think there's a way to do it actually, as long as there's alternative parking, um, especially as we look at how the museum is gonna come on board, parallel 45, probably some additional redevelopment that's gonna happen down there and a desire to bring like the street trees and the pavement and everything up to second street to really kind of round out that core area, but it it still needs to function. I mean, the restaurants still need to get deliveries. The Cisco trucks still need to somehow try to make it down the alleys or park out front and, you know, the utility trucks getting around. So there is a very kind of practical functional perspective, you know, to Alex's point of how do we, how do we accommodate that? And I think there's also this might be divided in the community, but there's a strong desire to still keep our agricultural roots and to be able to see a tractor driving down the main street five years from now and not have them feel like they're getting kind of kicked off or, you know, you, you tractors are more troublesome now. And so you need to, you need to find a different way to get from A to B. Yep. Yeah, no, that's, that's, yeah, no, you're, I appreciate, I, I appreciate you guys. Um, Cause you're, you're all, I mean, you're all exactly right. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's tough. So anyways, I guess we'll, we'll keep on talking about this. It's not like we're going to solve it uh, tonight, but, but the consultant is coming up with, with uh, some preferred alternatives. They're trying to get us to the point where uh, where we can really have, <laughs> have all of it, right. You know, where we can try and try and do all of that stuff. So hopefully we can, uh, hopefully we can get there. Right. Uh, who knows? So anyways, that's pretty much what I got. Um, any other thoughts for, for any, anything? I had a neighbor ask about building codes here in town and wondering if there were any um, green energy requirements for new building commercial or residential in the city of Independence. So that's a better question for um, Jeff Kennedy. Um, there is our building official. I know that we, they are, the state has um, a whole bunch of like energy code sort of stuff that he's having to implement now that's that's new um but yeah all of our building codes are related to state requirements we don't i don't think we have anything beyond them her question had to do with um having built residential buildings is in um in particular built to accept solar energies and does the city of independence look at that as asking builders to do that because it's so much more expensive to come in and do it later. I don't think we have any requirements like that. Thank you. All right. Um, any other discussion or information items we need to talk about? If not, uh, about a motion for adjournment? Um, we'll, have, we'll have a meeting next month, right? Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. I'll, make that I'll make that motion. Second. To adjourn. Is there a second? Second. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Meeting is adjourned. We'll see everybody next month. Happy New Year. Yeah.